I want to speak today, as you put it up on the PowerPoint, my dear brother, I want to speak on the subject of escaping the cycle of false expectations. Do you mind if I put that over there? Escaping the cycle of false expectation. You know this, and I know that, that we are the byproduct of our environmental conditioning. And you are your greatest preacher. You are not listening to me. You are listening to the biocomputer that courses through your mind today. And you see, whether you win or lose is what you believe on the inside. You will never rise above the level of who you think you are. In fact, the biocomputer of your mind never goes to sleep. Now, most of us had a good night's sleep last night. But the fact is that there's a part of you, there's a component of you that never sleeps, that's working on the job 24-7. And that's your mind. That's the biocomputer of your mind. And today I want to talk about escaping the cycle of something that's false. And I want us to turn, as you turn with me, dear brother, to the PowerPoint in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 16 through to 17 in the New King James Version. I love the Bible. I still think there's room for the Bible in our churches. Talk to me. Second crown, it says, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he, and we always put the she in there, is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I want to read it as you follow me, brother, in the Amplified Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Flick it over. Thank you. You're doing a great job. It says, Consequently, from now on, we estimate and regard no man from a purely human point of view in terms of natural standards of value. No. Even though we once did estimate Christ from a human point, viewpoint and as man as a man yet now we have such knowledge of him that we know him no longer in the terms of the flesh you can know about jesus you could sing about jesus you could talk about jesus you can do make palms about jesus write palms about and still die jesus said except you believe that i am you are going to die in your sin come on now he said it not me so, you know, the world gets all romantic at Easter and Christmas, but they keep doing what they do after their service, after the one or two services they attend every year. But here the Bible's talking about not to know Christ after the flesh, not a figment of my imagination, but to know him by relationship after the spirit. Therefore, if any, any person is engrafted in Christ, the Messiah, he is a new creation altogether. A new, uh, a new creation, the old previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh has come you. And I want to do this, and I'm spending a little time on this to lay the foundation, dear friends, in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 17 in the Message Bible. It says, because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. Thank God for that. We looked at the Messiah that way once and got it all wrong, as you know. We certainly do, don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside. And what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start is created new, the old life is gone, and the new life begins. You see, as you follow me, friend, on the PowerPoint, 
We live in a world, a culture, our worldly culture, and you flick it over, friends. Our worldly, you have to follow me, I might move fast. Our worldly culture places people in boxes. We talk about the divorcee, one who had a fall, failure. We talk about the rich, the talent, the handsome, the pretty, those that live in the, on the top end or the best part of town. And whether we like it or not, we put people in frames. We are more interested in society and sadly in the church today, we're more interested than in the externals than we are on the, in, of the internals. But you take your Bible, over 90 times in the New Testament, the Scripture says, within, within, within. Our world, it's out. It's cosmetic. Who's got the best? Now, I'm not, I'm not against looking good. I'm not against living, having a nice car, having a nice house, and all these things. But what I am against, when you judge another man and a woman who doesn't have that same privilege. And I believe, dear friends, that the focus of God is within. You are what you are on the inside. You will never rise above the level of who you think you are on the inside. You are your greatest preacher. You are speaking to you 24-7. If you say you can't, you're never going to do it. And, you know, and I'll, I'll get passionate here about this house. I'll speak into this house without a shadow of a doubt. But I want to say this, that we put pastors sometimes, we put people in boxes. Maybe some pastors would come to this house and they'd say, oh, there's no real good PowerPoint. There's no dark lights. It's old-fashioned. You're in a blimmin' old community hall. Give it a flick that God has a purpose. And I want to say this, I want to encourage you, dear hearts. Don't be like the guy next door. Be you and be what God has called you to do. And I'm getting ahead of myself. But you're a man who cries for a visitation. And your eyes, like the servant of old, have said, my eyes have seen the glory. And you've known, and let me depart in peace. That's not going to happen to you. But the point is, no, I hope not. But the point is this. You've seen the glory. You bask in the glory. And that you'll never be satisfied until you see it again. There is a river. You're not a scholar in Bible uh, acumen, but I want to say this. As I know you people, you have a hunger for the river of the anointing of the presence of God, and you have never lost it. And I'm here to tell you this, that there is a river of healing. There is a river that's going to give you another level of boldness, Neil. You're not wiped up. You're not washed up. You're not a spring chicken. But I want to say that hunger, that thirst, that river of the presence of the anointing of God is going to carry you to another level in the Holy Ghost. You will never know the impact of your lives flowing in obedience with the Holy Ghost in this nation and the nations of the world because you're hungry for that river of God. And you know, I sat there and I thought about the river. That river that's going to wash away a lot of rubbish and debris, but it's going to bring refreshing. You are the recipients of a man and a woman who have chosen not to go and sleep in a hammock and do nothing, but to keep going. And how we know God has an eternal purpose for them and for you. Can anyone say amen? So don't let anyone put you in a box. We are victims of what people say. I want to, would you turn me now to 1 Samuel 16, verse 1 to 7. It says, and we're going to deal with David, and we're going to talk about his anointing, and then we'll get into it. It says, now the Lord said to Samuel, 
How long will you mourn for Saul? You know, when ministers lose it, you know, people grieve, seeing I rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill your horn with oil. Go and I'm sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice. Next one, please. Then invite Jesse to sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name you, name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming. I used to have such a sharp word of knowledge and prophecy years ago, it scared me. And, you know, I've got to be totally honest. I asked the Lord to take it from me. I did. And that's true because I was so blim and austere. Kids were scared of me. Everybody was scared of me. And I remember, I, I, you were too, I would pick people out. And, you know, you get sued today. You're a lesbian. You're a homosexual. I'm not making this up. You get sued today if you did that. But I tell you, man, I, I remember moving and prophesying over and how would you like a pastor guest speaker and you're a lady and I say Jezebel called herself a prophetess that's a nice prep you know and you know I'm moving and the pastor said after me you know that woman sort of sets herself up set herself up as a prophetess and she's gathering money I was a, I could take you all day I remember walking down to church and I picked out a guy and I said if you don't work with your hands you don't eat and he was in ex-Bible college, and he was sucking money in behind the scenes. And, I, you know, I could tell you even some more. I remember, I, I, I'll just tell you one more. I was in a meeting, and I, and I suddenly hit my spirit that the, the assistant pastor, married with a couple of kids, was having an adulterous relationship with a beautiful girl that had hair down, this is many years ago, right down there. You know, have long hair is fashion. It wasn't too much hair. And true enough, and I said to the song leader, I said, would you keep it going? Would you keep it going? And I, well, I called her into the room, and I broke it open. And I tell you, the whole of the house, another one, meeting, I better not say anymore. But the, and, you know, and I was austere. And, you know, here's Samuel coming to the, to the city, and they trembled. So I changed. I want people to love me. I don't want people to be scared of me. You go and lay your hands and start to bring a word over people and their hearts just melting through their chest. I want to be the good boy. Neil can be that now. Everyone says prophesy, prophesy, prophesy. We want you to prophesy. Hillsong College asked me twice to prophesy over 2,000 people, and I refused twice because I want to say this. When you get a word from God, or when you give a word, it's serious. The young man, I'd roll up my sleeves. Remember those days, Neil, when Clark and I prophesied a thousand people at night, and, and, and they go, hey, come on now, wisdom builds his house. And I resist being co coerced into prophecy anymore. Prophecy is not like being a blooming guru. Prophecy is hearing a word from God, the Spirit of the Lord, hey, this is pretty biblical, has placed you not in a small place, but in a large capacity. I see furnished before you a table. There's not meanness. There's not leanness. You just haven't got just a few little snags or something on the table. There's a lustness. There's bounty. And I believe that God is going to bless you on behalf of the others. So you can be a, uh, they can be a recipient of what God wants to do. You've got to believe for better things. Amen? Look at me, dear. You've got to believe for it. Go after it. Man, I'm mischievous. <laughs> I've enjoyed our friendship with your pastor. I, I, uh, I said to Joe, my wife, who couldn't be here this morning, I said, oh, I think I'll go earlier. So 
to get up early to come this morning. And, I, and she said, why don't you stay with Neil? And I didn't want to burden them. And, and I, I said to Joe, no, 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 no. And then I thought, I will. And I rang Neil, and I texted him, and I said, look, uh, you know, and he came back, you want to stay in a motel or with you? And I've had a ball, more so with his wife than him. <coughs> it's great, we go back a long way. Well, let's get back into the scripture. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably, I come to sacrifice to the Lord. The next one, please, sanctify yourselves, come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they, it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Eliab was the, the, the oldest son of Jesse. The next one, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him for the Lord does not see as a man sees for man looks at the outward appearance. We don't know a man after the flesh. We don't look at the outside. We look on the inside. But the Lord looks at the heart. Next one, please. I want to speak today, dear friends. The next one, thank you. On four areas for which you and I need to escape the cycle of expectation. Number one, Satan. Now, in the modern day church, most Pentecostal churches, you never hear the word devil or Satan mentioned. That's a fact. I'm in a lot of churches. And, you know, we think we're smart. We think we know better than God. We think we know better than the Bible. And it's all life skills. It's feeling good. But I want to tell you this. Why is it in Australia we've got 13,000 pastors who have left the ministry, who are no longer holding the truth? Because we, and part of it is, it's our philosophy, what we believe. And, you know, and I'm not, you know, we were creatures of extreme. The pendulum, you know, we were back in those days, Neil, when you coughed, you got a devil. Everything was a devil. You got a flat tire, it's a devil. If you didn't have any money at the end of the week, it's a devil. And we blamed the devil. But, you know, that was stupidity. But now, because we wanted to reform and get it, back into a right kernel, we go the other way and we don't think the devil's around anymore. I've just done a very, very serious study, and I won't do it today, on the satanic activity in that New Testament. We're at war. Paul the Apostle says, having done all stand. Dr. Billy Graham once said, I'm yet to see a man who has a regular quiet time, have a breakdown. That's true. Last Monday, yesterday, we buried a, a man who was one of our top guys in one of our care industry who uh, self-destructed. And I could go on and on and on, tell you of people who are losing it and suicide and mental health are major issues in our nation. And I want to say this, dear friends, there are satanic powers that want to seduce you and I. There are, and he's real. And that's why we've got to know Christ after the Spirit. And you know, with Paul the Apostle, the great Apostle, who had an encounter with Jesus, smitten blind, supernaturally filled with the Holy Ghost, went into the Arabian desert, and he was instructed at the, at the feet of Jesus for three years, your pastor did the communion. Did you know that Paul the Apostle gives more revelation of the communion than the disciple? And he wasn't there when Jesus took the bread and uh, than all the other disciples. He got it in the Arabian desert. He had an experience. We was caught up to the third heaven. And listen to this, dear friends. He heard things that were not lawful to be uttered by the human tongue. 
He was up there. He was a heavyweight. He was a giant. But that same man, in the book of Thessalonica says, we tried to get through to Thessalonica several times. Listen, to this. he said, but Satan hindered me. So you're a wise, intelligent person to realize without being paranoid that there are powers that want to strip you. You see, dear friends, if the devil can get you to trip, he gets a bonus. Now, if I was preaching that in some other country, I'd say in fun, he gets a bonus for the holiday in surface paradise. But maybe here he gets a bonus in Singapore. If he, you see, I'm not trying to be talk about paranoia. I'm not trying to be talk about stupidity, that the church is full of stupidity today. It is. But I'm talking about realism. I'm talking about Satan is out to impression, uh, impression your mind. How many know the Bible says he's the God of this world, New Testament, who blinds the mind? Jesus turns to um, Simon Peter and he said, Whom do men? This is not, no, no, that's not the sinister. I'm just using his illustration. You're a good guy. And he said, Whom do men say that I am? And Simon says, oh, you're the son of the living God, da, da, da. And Jesus turns to Simon Peter and he said, Simon, uh, blessed are you, Simon, and so on. Flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And Simon has a swelled up, Je hallelujah, guys. I don't think I'll eat with you for the next week because I'm special. But just a little bit down the road, Jesus turns to Peter when he's talking about his crucifixion, and Peter gets all up in arms and said, never, never, never. And Jesus talks to him and rebukes him. And listen to this. He said, get behind me, Satan. I passed it for 52 years. But if I called someone Satan in the church, I tell you, man, there'd be a massive fallout. You look like a happy guy. What's your name? What would you do, Greg, if I say, Get behind me, Satan. Your wife, is that your wife? She'd claw my eyes out. You touch a you, she'd break my face. <laughs> but you see, satanic powers, we could go on and on. We're to fight. And sir, madam, there are times where you feel the sick. You have got to take the Bible. You have got to quote the scripture. You have to contend. You have to speak in tongues. Come on now. You have to break through. We've got to break. You know, if Satan wins, he gets the bonus. And I often say to my wife, we've lost two children, one adult child in her 20s and a baby daughter. And I say, and, I say, and I'm not, yeah, I'm a happy chappy, you trust me. And I say, Joan, you are going to be careful. There's something over us wants to take us out. You know, you name it, I've had it. Slander, disloyalty, you name it. Build an organization that has several hundred, over 420 staff, King's massive organization, and that every demon in hell's had a crack at me. And I know loneliness. I know what the, about my being slandered. I know a lot of things because there are satanic powers that want to rip asunder the ministry. Number two, am I a bit too strong on you? You okay? Should I tame it down a bit? Number two, society. Listen, the average person in society does not want you to win. There's not too many people in society. What's your name, dear? Sorry? Sharon. There's not too many people in society say, Sharon, go, go to it, girl. You can do it. You've made a good stuff. And pumping in faith. Mostly they're waiting for Sharon to flip over, and they could say, oh, I told you so. She ain't got the talent. She and all that. Society in the general is very cruel. Society is not supportive. Society wants us to fall over, and especially when we're Christians, because we're a threat to their lifestyle. When our new prime minister 
who's a Pentecostal prime minister, and these people, these Christians, have put all this hallelujah stuff on the, on the Facebook. I resisted. But I was nearly going to say one Bible verse, you know, darkness hates light. And I can't prophesy he's going to survive. I got a, I got something I know, and I won't say. But I tell you what, she's going to be rough stuff. They don't like us. Society. We got these lovely, nice people. So you know that. But in general, they could do without us because our lifestyle is a threat to their lifestyle. You have to break through. You have to believe what you believe. You have to say, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Talk to me. So you've got to learn to break through the demands and the expectation of society. The next one is your peers and your family. Thank you, my dear brother. You know, I'm not saying don't respect your family. I'm not saying don't respect your, 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 your brothers and your sisters. But sometimes they get it wrong. I'm from a family of eight, four boys and four girls. And when I had a desire to go into the ministry, my, not one of my brothers and sisters said, oh, hallelujah, kinder, go for it. They mocked me. They laughed at me. Some of them ridiculed me. But I had to fight through it. I started a first church. In Invercargill, New Zealand, we were 22 years of age, just married. We saw a move of God of 750 decisions for Christ in two and a half years. I've seen a move. And that church has hundreds today, buildings and properties. But the point is this, I had to break through what my brothers, what my sisters said. My parents, they never mocked me, but there was no encouragement there. Your peers, you know, you, you think, oh, you want to go into business. Oh, I wouldn't go to business. You haven't got this and you haven't got that. And, you know, not too many people encourage you on the sidewalks of life. Sir, so, madam, you've got to break through the cycle of unfair expectation. You know, we don't do anything in life. If we listen to people, I, I, for years I was going to take a cup and I've never done it. I better do it before I cark it one day. I'm going to do that. And I was going to get a mug and I was going to print on the outside, don't let the dissenters be the deciders. You see, within you is gold. Within you, within you, within you there are souls. Within you there are books. Within you, there is a mission endeavor. Within you, there's a propensity to make money for the kingdom. Oh, yes, in you. But what holds us back? Number one, Satan. Number two, society. And number three, our peers and even our parents can hold us back. Did you know the great Martin Luther was a highly educated man? Did you know that he had a very wealthy father? who wanted to become a solicitor. He had a credible mind, Martin Luther. And then one day, Martin Luther was walking through a field and a, a bolt of lightning hit him. And he made a vow to God. He said, if I survive, I'll go into the monastery. When he went and talked to his father, and you can get history says you can hear from Martin, a long way, way, way off, the shouting of anger of his father. What did Martin Luther do? He had to push through. I know people, ministers, and I've had words of knowledge over them overseas, and, and they, I didn't know that. And the very next day, in an Indian culture, he told, the mother kicked him out of the house, a family house. And the price, it's all been healed and reconciled now. But you see, our peers and our family, how many know the story of King David, with the weight of a nation on his spirit. Now think of this. If he lost, the kids would get raped. The women would be abused. The men would be slaved. 
and the nation of Israel would be servants to the Philistines. And the king took about unbelief. He had his back against the wall. And listen to this. This is not a fable. This is not a, just a kindergarten story. He gave, he was so desperate, he put the fate of an entire nation into the hands of a 17-year-old boy. What a joke. And this 17-year-old boy, David, goes to the front line and he hears the soldiers talking about the reward. Hey, and he heard them, and you read it, and then Samuel, and, and he said, run that by me again. And, and here he said, the king says, whoever slays David, sorry, Goliath, he would be free of tax, never pay tax again in his life. That's an answer. And he'd get this beautiful dish of a woman, the girl. And David said, run that by me. And who was it that came to him and scolded him and was angry with him was his oldest brother, Eliab, who Samuel the prophet thought he was the good one. And he ripped it to him. And he said, no, the naughty is of your heart. Now here's the point. David did not go home to his father. I haven't got a handkerchief. I normally owe his hand. And, and cried, <laughs> Dad! <laughs> Dad! Eliab hurt me! I'm never going to go there again! You know, that's what some people do. Some people want you to love them. You want people to love you all the time. Well, I've got news for you. They won't. You have got to break through the unfair expectation. Amen. I was in Invercargill for 18 and a half years. We built one of the biggest churches, that's true. My clerk over took the town hall back and they say, so it's only 50,000 in the community. And all the years, never once, did the clergy ever invite me to any of their meetings. They were jealous. I must admit I did provoke them, Neil. I used to advertise I used to advertise, join the happy hundreds. Because they had about 50 or 60, 80, 90, 100, and it was like salt in the wound. And you know, I was just a guy having a go. But I broke through. I broke through. If I kept you, told you on the, on, on, on the Gold Coast, the stuff we've had, being in courts, National, national TV, some of you, and all that rubbishy stuff. Allegations, fraud, sue, you name it. But we broke through. We broke through. We broke through. Years ago, Neil, there was, and we won't mention his name publicly. See, I came from a family of eight, and I, you won't believe this, but I was a, a stutterer. I used to stutter with fear. Very quiet boy, shy. And when my family had guests around, this is true, I'd go and hide and sit in my room. I was shy. When I first went to work as a young butcher and they made a mistake of my wage, from that day to this, I never queried it. Now, you know, my wife, mother would take me out for some place and the hostess lady would come and she'd say, Kinder, would you like a cookie on a plate? And I take one, and then it come around again. I wanted it, but somehow I was shy, and I, I'd say no, thank you. It was my, that's why even staying, it's something I've had to break through over the years. I, I don't like putting people out. <laughs> True, but the point is this: there was five years, and I went into the ministry, and I was very shy, very quiet. You don't believe that? You don't believe it? But it's true. I think I told you this once, I was, I was taking my wedding and we had no carpet like this and I shook, they gave me the ring to give to the bridegroom. I was so nervous, I, the ring dropped and we'd tinkle, tinkle down the back. So, you know, and I'd take some early, as a younger man, I'd take uh, funerals and I'd be ashen white and my wife said, you'll be the next for the box. I remember once uh, I got up and the, the place was packed, the, the church, cause, and there were speakers there, you know, pastors from other churches. And I got up, Alistair was there too, and I got stage fright, stage fright. 
and nothing came out. I tell you, man, so here's the point. Five years into the ministry, one of my key guys of the New Life Churches in New Zealand, he came up to me and he said, Kinder, congratulations. We thought you wouldn't make it. If I told you the nations I preached in, if I told you the things that by the grace of God, and I'm not making such stadium to 200,000, pastors' conferences in Jakarta of 12,000, 5,000, 3,000, and I'm there uh, next month or the month after in a church, a mega, you know, massive, five meetings and, and all these balconies, done it for years. Some years ago, unfortunately, when we lost our second daughter, I started to do grief seminars, and I tell you, I started off accidentally, never, never wrote an article, never preached on grief. As far as I'm concerned, people who grieve are weak people. Next month, I'm doing a four-hour seminar out of town. Just done seven in, in Jakarta, where around the area where the plane went down with 92 Christians, 152 lost their lives. But anyway, I, I wrote a manuscript, and I'm not here to sell them. I haven't got them here. But the point is this, and I went through to a journalist in Brisbane one day years ago. I wanted her opinion, and she, she scolded me. She ripped into me. She demeaned me, and I tell you, man, I don't know how many accidents I almost had coming back from Brisbane to the Gold Coast. I was absolutely devastated. I, I spiraled into, de into depression, and I said, I'm never going to do anything. But somehow I broke through the cycle of false expectations. And I've authored a book. These books are now in their fifth print. I'm not going to say too much because you think I might be big noting myself, but I'm doing the seminar, and uh, they did a seminar, and I'd forgotten. I've had 100,000 registered attendees to my meetings. Grief and crisis. Those books were used throughout Australia in the naval. The chaplains used them to, for their chaplaincy. 8,000 went down to the fires a few years ago. And I want to say this, not because I'm big, but listen, they said you can't do it. They said you can't write. They said you can't preach. They said this church is just a blooming hillbilly church. I haven't heard it. But I'm here to tell you, you can break through the cycle of false expectation and be great. Can anyone say amen? And the next one, and I know the next one is very, very important. That's yourself. We're hard on ourselves. We're hard on ourselves. Well, because we had a bad, uh, uh, you know, past. A lot of negatives, a lot of rubbish, a lot of baggage. You know, the Bible says, love thy neighbor as thyself. You know what the average person does? They love their neighbor and despise themselves. Now, I know time is gone, but I want to say this. You've got to break through putting yourself down. Can anyone say amen? You are not inferior. Neither are you superior but you have a, a God-given anointing on the inside and you were born, hallelujah, to do great things in society. And until you believe it, am I too passionate for you? Quickly, Satan, society, peers, family, ourselves, we've got to break through, break through, break through. Next one. <laughs> Thank you. Isaiah 51, verse 23, one of the saddest Bible verses in the Scripture, as far as I'm concerned. It says this. It says, I will put into the hand of those who afflict you, who have said to you, uh, lie down that we may walk over you, and you have laid your body, your soul, like the ground as the street for those who walk over you. Sir, madam, you've got to get up. You've got to push through. You've got to flick all those negatives. And I want to say with every ounce of passion again, 
I commend your past. I commend, and this is not because I'm here, I've said it. He's not a spring chicken, you notice that. His wife is not a spring chicken, you notice that. But I tell you this, you know, the average is let's hang up our guns at 65. That's the time to retire ministry. What a lot of rubbish. Amen. And there they are having a go for God. It's seen the great and built the great and built something massive here on the Sunshine Coast. They could crawl in a hole. They could say never again, once bitten, twice shy, but they've risen again. Oh, I love it. My wife was here. I'm glad she wouldn't. She'd be head down and praying up, say, Kinder, don't blow it. Second Corinthians 4, 7. Listen to me, dear friends. This church has potential. Don't you think it's a blimmin' church tucked away in an old rented hall and, you know, we've got some older people, the pastors are getting on in age. He's only, uh, he's only uh, about five years older than me, four years older than me, so just that I look so young. But anyway, Second Corinthians 4 verse 7, it says, Well, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power of God may be of God. We're not looking on the outward. We're fools ourselves. We ain't got too much. Really, we haven't. But the God on the inside. The God of the Spirit achieves tremendous things. Very quickly, there are four ways we can escape. Number one, by accepting. We accept what God says. Number two, by believing what God says. Don't let the word put you down. You believe it. Number three, by acting. Sir, madam, don't act like a blimmin' church mouse. Don't act like a pauper. Don't act by someone who's just an accident going somewhere to happen. Act as though you're a son and a daughter of a living God. Can anyone say amen? Oh, you're not too bad. Number four, number four, confessing. You confess what God says. If I listen to what people say about me, I'd never get out of bed in the morning. But I break through it. Romans 10, thank you, my dear brother. You've done a wonderful job. It says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That word confess, many of us know, means the word homolog. It's the Greek homologies, which means to agree with, to say the same thing. God looks on the inside. God has an investment. God, by the Holy Ghost, actually believes for our destiny. Amen. A triple principle, uh, and I will close. Accept what God says. Avoid, you know, there's a lot of people I won't have fellowship with. I really won't. All they want is put you down, put you down, put you down. You feel depressed after them. I run with those that believe in me and the future. Talk to me. The next one is adjust. Put off, put on. If you're jealous, Work on it. If you're moody, work on it. If you're depressed, work on it. War against it. Don't let the devil win. Can anyone say amen? Now, any teachers, any ex-teachers here today? This is, oh, a lot. So let's have a look at this. The next one, thank you. Thank you, my brother. Neil Mahoney in her book, Beliefs Can Influence Attitude, pointedly illustrates this truth. Mahoney tells of a double-blind experiment conducted in the San Francisco Bay Area. The principal of a school called three professors together and said, because you are three teachers, are the finest in the system, and you have the greatest expertise, we're going to give you 90 high IQ students. We're going to let you move these students through this next year at your own pace, and see how much they can earn. Next one, thank you, my dear brother. Everybody was delighted, faculty and students alike. Over the next year, the professors and the students thoroughly enjoyed themselves. The professors were teaching the brightness, brightest teachers. The students were benefiting from the close attention and the instruction of the highly skilled teachers. By the end of the experiment, the teachers had achieved from 20 to 30% more than the other students in the whole area. Next one, the principal called the teachers in and told them, I have a confession to make. 
I, I have to confess that you did not have 90 of the most intellectually prominent students. They were the run-of-the-mill students. We took 90 students at random from the system and gave them to you. The teacher said, this means that we are exceptional teachers. The principal continued, I have another confession. You're not the brightest of the teachers. Your names were the first drawn from the list. And friends, as I close up, as I close up, what made the difference? The power of expectancy. It's what you expect. I want you all to stand. I realize time kids have come. And I want to just quickly corporately pray over you today. That's all I've got time for. <coughs> I want you to believe God. Can anyone say amen? I want you to believe the presence of the Holy Ghost over your life. Now I'm resisting picking people out because time, but sir and madam, you, you two there, you're goodly ones, you're good people, you're nice people. And you've had, I tell you, you've been through the ringer of life. And sometimes you've even doubted your own, uh, not sanity, but your own ability. But I want to say God sees all. And I want to say this, you stand tall in your own fervor, in your own righteousness. Not being a bigot, but just enjoying this phase of life because the Holy Ghost is going to envelop people around you and you are going to be a blessing to them. Amen. God, raise your hands to the Lord right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every man. I pray for every woman. I pray, our God, for every family. I pray for every child. And Father, I pray for this house. That Father, that it'll grow wider, it'll grow deeper, and it'll grow higher. And Father, may there come like Joseph's bow, whose branches shall go over the wall. For the Spirit of the Lord has touched this house. It's unique, but it has a purpose. And out of this house, like Joseph, a goodly bow, your branches will go over, they've already gone, but they will go over the walls. The power of influence. And one of the things, friends, you've got to wrestle with and break through. Oh, we've just got retirees. We've just got people and all that. Hey, you've got God people. You've got God people. Can you say that? Honey, you've got a lovely spirit. Lovely. You've got an openness. Allow that openness. You know, let your meditations be quickened. I see God just gently quickening your meditation. It's a simplicity. Don't doubt it. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless this house in Jesus. Amen. Just uh, hang on. And that's full of spit. <laughs> just about got slain in the spit. Just hang on. If people just you, if people need to go, God bless you. But also, Kinder, I want to release you to be able to minister to people uh, as you feel. Come on. You're not getting away that easy. Just uh, as you feel. But look, folks, please, what we're going to do is we're going to have a bucket at the door. I'm sorry, we're not going to take up an offering. We'll just sort it out after. But there'll be a bucket at the door if you want to give something. But uh, Kinder, you just feel free. Music team, I want you to pray over them. For the anointing, pray over everything. Oh, Lord. Time is always a premium. That's our challenge, isn't it? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for your touch. I thank you for your presence. Lord, I pray. I pray, oh God. Uh, I just thank you for it. I see Joseph's storehouse over you two. You two. It was said of Joseph of old. He opened the storehouse in the time of famine. And I want to say this, you've seen a lot as you've walked through the corridors of life. But I tell you, this store, this store, this store. And God wants to use you to open something for those who lack. Who famished 
who are in need of grain. And I believe it's vital. It's not something that's, you know, you thought up there, it's vital. Let the touch of God come over your life in Jesus' name. Father, I'm always conscious you pick some out, you don't pick some out. I sort of like to bless people. There's many you want to be prayed for, just come up and I'll just go right through you, all right? Don't go through you, I'll pray for you. <laughs> just come up, all those that want to be blessed. Those that don't, it's not that you're not blessed, but I, I am so conscious. I'm so conscious of, you know, I want to bless people. And I thank you, Pastor, for giving me an opportunity to have a go. Father, in the name of Jesus.